Good morning, ladies. I hope you're enjoying Labor Day weekend and getting a little extra time for relaxation and spending some time outside or with family and friends. I'm going to talk with you first about some of what you're going to read about this week and then go over some homework and um, information about the upcoming quiz. Okay, so first of all, the book will talk about the D, the D source or the Deuteronomic historian. And this is kind of the name that we give to the person who compiled the information that you can find in the historical writings and the prophets. Okay, so the historical writings cover some of the early history and do talk about some of the prophets, but the prophetical books are books named after the prophets and are about kind of what they prophesied. Uh, those are broken into major and minor prophets, and that's just referring to the length of their books, not necessarily how important they were. So the D source, we think, was written kind of at the end of a long history that we'll talk about in a moment, and wants to kind of give hope to the people in the midst of a time where they feel very hopeless. Okay, so um, they have sort of a pattern to what they say, basically, when the people obey God, good things happen, and when people disobey God, bad things happen. So whenever they saw bad things happen, they thought that was God's punishment. And I think today sometimes people still feel this way, like if something bad happens to them, what did I do wrong? Obviously, we really don't believe that's true anymore, that God like strikes people down or punishes people or afflicts them, but rather those are just things that we can't fully comprehend or why they have to happen as humans. So we'll talk about the judges, and just for the record, the judges are charismatic leaders, meaning that they weren't appointed, elected by the people, but rather they just rose to the occasion, and so when the people needed a leader, they came forth and they led the people. Oftentimes this was leading people through battles, uh, but sometimes the judges did what they sound like they did, and they would kind of settle disputes, okay? But again, they weren't elected, they just rose to the occasion, and they just ended up being what the people needed at the time. Uh, one of my favorite judges is a woman named Deborah, and she leads a battle in the Old Testament, which seems very unlikely. And I think that's kind of an overall underlying theme, too, is that God chooses a lot of very unlikely people, as you'll hear about in a moment. So basically, the judges sort of rule as needed, um, but this is kind of a lawless time. And the reason for that is because people think Yahweh is their God and their king, and they shouldn't have a human person in that role. But eventually the people do start to demand that there be a king, um, someone who can rule them consistently all the time. And so God speaks through Samuel and says, you know, give the people what they want, basically. And what the people want is Saul to be the king. So Saul is the first king. Meanwhile, Samuel also appoints a young David to be the king. David is the eighth son of Jesse, and this is very unlikely, again, that anyone who's the eighth son of anyone would be a person to rise to the position of king. Uh, but again, God chooses very unlikely people. So Saul is king for a while, and David actually is a harpist in Saul's kingdom. He kind of plays for Saul whenever he's feeling low. And we know about Saul that he had lots of migraine headaches, so David kind of helped in those situations. But we also... It kind of seems like Saul was maybe a little crazy. Um, there was times where he tried to kill David. There was a time where David could have killed Saul and didn't, but instead just cut off a piece of his cloak to show him later, look, I had a chance to kill you, and I didn't. Um, eventually, Saul is in a battle where it's clear he's going to lose, and so he throws himself on his own sword and dies. Eventually, I mean, at first, Saul's kids rule, but the people come to David and want David to be their king. And David, in the eyes of the Jewish people, is the greatest of all the kings. This is for a couple of reasons. One was he was a great military leader. Another was he brought a lot of power and affluence to the people. He really established them as a country where they were really a stronghold. But also there's a story with David where he sees this beautiful woman bathing on a roof. Her name's Bathsheba. And he sends for her. And they bring her to him and he sleeps with her and impregnates her. Uh, one problem is that Bathsheba has a husband who's been off at war. So as soon as people realize Bathsheba's pregnant, they're going to know that her husband Uriah could not be the father. So um, David brings Uriah home from battle. Uriah, though, won't sleep with Bathsheba because he wants 
to be in solidarity with his soldiers who, who can't do that. So then David has him sent to the front lines of a battle where he's killed, and he quickly marries Bathsheba, and that way he thinks no one will know that he slept with her. But then David is confronted by this court prophet who God has inspired. And when the court prophet confronts him, instead of denying it or having the prophet killed, he throws himself on the ground and he begs forgiveness. And this is part of what the Jewish people would point to as what made him a great king. He was also humble and recognized God as the foremost power. When David dies, his son Solomon takes over. Solomon was known for his wisdom, um, but Solomon wasn't as great of a king, a little bit more selfish. And so eventually the kingdom divides into two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. And eventually these two kingdoms are destroyed. First, Israel in the north, and they're destroyed by the Assyrians. And then Judah in the south, and they're destroyed by the Babylonians. And this becomes famously known as the Babylonian exile because all the Jews that are left are sent to live in Babylon, and they disperse them. They split them up so they can't overthrow them, and they start thinking of themselves more as Babylonians. And anyway, that's known as the diaspora, the dispersed Jews. And we think it's this time that the D source chooses to write because the people have really lost faith. And so he writes to remind them of God intervening and of their great history. In the next chapter, you're going to read more about the Jews in particular at the time. There are three things that are important to the Jews at the time. The temple, there's this beautiful ornate temple that Solomon had built, and it's gorgeous, and that's where they go for pilgrimages, and it's a very important place. The Torah, or the Torah, is the uh, Pentateuch, as we call it, their sacred writings. And then also the promise of a Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. And they believe that someone is going to come that's much like David, that will be like a military leader, that will restore their position of power and bring them this affluence again. Um, and so they know that God is going to send the Messiah, they just don't know when, and they're waiting for the Messiah. Also, you'll read about different types of Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, uh, scribes. Uh, one group it doesn't really talk about as much are the Zealots, and these are kind of over-enthusiastic Jews who really believed that they could overthrow Rome or whoever the leader is at the time. And it's just they're not very logical, they're just very passionate, um, but they're known as the Zealots. And eventually, at the end of this point, the Christians start to enter the story. So enjoy the reading. It's a lot of history, um, but it will help you hopefully understand where the Jews have been when we start talking about early Christianity. I do want to talk about a couple of the upcoming things. So this week, first of all, you'll participate in a discussion, and there's a question that's already posted. You need to respond to that question by 11.55 a.m. on Tuesday, and then respond to someone else's post by 11.55 a.m. on Thursday. The reason for 11.55 a.m. again is in case you have any technological problems, then you can contact PC Help and get them resolved during that day. Um, also, you're going to take your first quiz this week. You need to take that by Friday at 11.55 a.m. Feel free to work ahead on it. Um, for the quiz, you will be asked 25 multiple choice questions and you'll have 45 minutes to answer. If you have that notes page or the notes pages from each week and you've been taking the notes, um, I would have those out. I would have your book out. You can obviously use both of those things to answer those questions. Finally, I want you to start thinking about the research paper that you're going to write this semester. Um, it's not due for several weeks, uh, but it would be good for you to start thinking about it. For the paper, you have to make an argument for a person or event being the most important person or event in church history. You cannot write about Jesus. Obviously, Jesus is the most important person. But, you know, in addition to Jesus, who else made the biggest contribution? And I know you really have just started to scratch the surface of who you could write this paper about, but I encourage you to look at the table of contents and the index and start to get a sense of someone that you could write about or some event and start thinking that through because by October 6th, you need to turn in an outline for that paper kind of broken it up so you do an outline and then a work cited later and then finally the paper to kind of help you work on it over time so you're not doing it at the last minute and it's not as stressful hopefully. 
So be thinking about that. You don't have to tell me who your who your topic is. Um, I'll figure that out when you turn in the outline. But again, it just wouldn't hurt for you to start thinking about it. Have a great week. I'll talk to you next week.